As long as I remember to unmute, we'll be fine. Good morning, you.
Well, good morning. Good morning. My pleasure to welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ to our worship this morning. I want to start out with uh, just a few announcements for you. It is uh, Sanctity of Human Life uh, Sunday, uh, and we are uh, uh, keeping that, I guess, uh, uh, promoting uh, that uh, in our worship this morning. And so uh, you'll see uh, a flyer, first of all, from the Women's Center of Northwest Indiana. We've uh, long supported them uh, and uh, will continue to. Uh, so, uh, if you want to check out their information on their website, uh, there's a lot of good stuff there. Uh, also, uh, we are uh, uh, going to sponsor a mini marriage uh, seminar uh, on the 13th of uh, February uh, for uh, couples and uh, singles. Um, we're also going to do, uh, along with that, a couple's clay pigeon shoot, and uh, that should be a good time. I was actually going to title the seminar, uh, Couples That Shoot Together, Stay Together, or Couples That Shoot Together Tend Not to Shoot One Another, but um, I got vetoed on that one, so mini marriage seminar uh, is what we're calling it, but it should be a good time. Uh, spend an afternoon together and uh, get to know one another a little bit better. So uh, if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, let us know, send us an email or uh, uh, text me and, and let me know your interest and we'll um, uh, be hopefully having a very good time on, on the 13th that's coming up here. Uh, other than that, uh, there's a few other announcements listed uh, in the backs of your bulletin and you can also find those on uh, the church's website as well. So, um, oh, I guess I should also mention one last thing about the congregational meeting uh, coming up in, in two weeks' time uh, on the uh, 27th of uh, January. Uh, there's information on the, the, the information desk uh, out there uh, that you can pick up. Uh, so please uh, uh, do so. All right, that being said, let's uh, turn our attention now to what we uh, came here to do, which is to uh, worship uh, our God. If you are able, please uh, stand with me uh, as he calls us uh, to worship him. From Psalm 45, uh, verse 6. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. Your robes are all fragrant, fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Daughters of kings are among your ladies of honor. At your right hand stands the queen in gold of Ophir. Uh, let's uh, continue to worship our God, uh, remain standing, and let's sing uh, praise back to him, O oh, worship the King. Thank you. 
look to you now for all things, uh, but we ask especially that you would bless our time of worship this morning. Uh, we would ask that your Holy Spirit would attend to everything that we do uh, here this morning. On your Son, Jesus, uh, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Our reading is from Psalm 139. Uh, we will read through the complete chapter. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O oh Lord. You hem me in, behind, and before. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? The depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. You have created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one past is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. If only you would slay the wicked, O God, away from me, you bloodthirsty men. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. I do not hate those. I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God. find our prayer of confession uh, in your bulletin, uh, would you please pray that with me uh, now. Our gracious Heavenly Father, there are countless reasons to come before you. Uh, 
uh, as we have uh, asked the Lord. Son, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, be assured of that. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the King. Anointed with grace, since God has blessed you. And your majesty ride forth victoriously in behalf of truth, humility, and righteousness. Let your right hand display awesome deeds. Let your wonderful words and wonderful assurance to an age where there is much turmoil. Uh, that it is God who fights uh, for us, and we need to let God fight. Uh, people that, that may disagree with us, people that may disagree with us strongly. Uh, that, that is they would be clothed uh, in uh, civility uh, and love. Uh, let's uh, go before him again. Uh, let's sing praise to our God. Uh, you'll find uh, hymn number 499 printed in our bulletins. Uh, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let's stand and sing as you're able. Each week we a guide to helping us understand the scriptures. They certainly are not uh, on the same level. Um, the 
direction and, and teaching uh, as to what the Bible has uh, to say. Uh, so uh, we begin again looking at the Westminster Shorter Catechism, and I would ask you this morning uh, from question one, Christian, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. Amen.
Jim. As you uh, find your seats, I invite you to uh, open your copy of God's Word to the book of Genesis, chapter 1, starting in verse uh, 25. We're looking at Genesis 1, 25 through 31 this morning. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and all the livestock according to their kinds, and everything that creeps in the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with its seed uh, and its fruit. You shall have them for food, and every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. As we approach, admittedly, a very uh, difficult and uh, can oftentimes be a controversial uh, topic, uh, such as human life and uh, what we are to do with it, what we are to understand about it, uh, we want to look to the scriptures. We want to be about the Bible and, and let it speak to us uh, on this topic. And so that's why we're looking at Genesis uh, chapter 1 uh, this morning. Uh, and as we uh, progress uh, as a society, as a country, uh, it, it does become, I think, very easy to lose hope. Uh, in uh, our society and in our country and in uh, the church's uh, desire to see uh, human life uh, preserved and respected and uh, given uh, its rightful place uh, in uh, the world and in the minds of our uh, leaders and in our own minds, our children's minds. And so uh, my first encouragement to you this morning would be not to lose hope. It's easy to, to lose hope. But by looking at the scriptures, the, my, my desire is to fill you again with hope if you're starting to lose uh, a little bit of it. Uh, admittedly, uh, I have my moments, I have my days myself when I uh, feel hope starting to slip away and, and, and falling into despair for mankind and, and humanity. And so uh, by looking uh, not just at Genesis 1, 25 through 31, but the entirety of chapter 1, uh, we see in our God uh, that by his very creation of the world, he reveals to us that he has both purpose and intentionality uh, in this world and therefore in our lives. First of all, God has a purpose for us. Uh, We see that, first of all, uh, in his very uh, bringing all of this about uh, by the word of his power. It shows us, it speaks to the fact that God has a plan. 
Uh, he doesn't do things willy-nilly. He's not a winsome God. He is a God who has a plan, a detailed plan for that matter, and it is God who will see to it that this plan comes to complete fruition in his complete and perfect timing. Uh, that's the second thing about his purpose. So, so we see he has a purpose. We see God is firmly committed to his purpose. Uh, God is not a God, as the Eastern religions would say, that is part of the creation. Uh, God is separate from his creation. We see that in Genesis 1, that God speaks and creation comes about. God is separate from the creation. There is a distinction, in other words, between the creator and the creation, but that does not mean that God uh, uh, takes a step back. No, God is uh, involved in this plan that he has. God is intricately involved in that. We have to look no further than the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Uh, this, is, this is what, we've said this before from here, this is what separates Christianity from every other of the world's religions. Every other religion would say that, that man has found a way to God, now go find God yourself. Here's the plan on how to do it. Christianity is radically different because it teaches us that, that God is the plan and God has come to earth to seek out his lost children. He does that in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, his only son. And so by looking to him, uh, you know not to lose heart because God is seeing to it that this plan is fulfilled. So never lose hope in God's plan for your salvation. But the second thing we see in Genesis 1 is the intentionality of God in his creation, in the design of his creation. There is great care that is taken, uh, that, that, that God is intricate, intricate. He is precise. Uh, when the Human Genome Project got uh, going back in uh, the mid-2000s, in 2002 or three, I believe it was, uh, I remember uh, there was sort of this collective gasp amongst the medical and scientific communities as they started to realize uh, this is intense, this is intricate, uh, that, that our DNA and, and even DNA is made up of more intricate uh, uh, molecules and, and RNAs and, and even that then breaks down as, as we peer even closer into it uh, with remarkable skill and design. Uh, you have to really look no further than that to see the intricacy of which God poured into his creation. He's a very, very intricate God. And we see that even in as these creation days progress, don't we? Uh, God starts by creating matter. He starts then by uh, separating uh, 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 light from darkness and dry land from water. And this entire account of creation is building. And it's building up to uh, a point where on the sixth day, you know, uh, each day getting more detailed, more intricate until finally... On the sixth day, God saves his very best for last in his creation of human beings. And yes, we do. As we read here, God takes more time. God uh, uh, pours his skill into the creation and the crafting of man, setting him apart from the rest of the created realm. Furthermore, God speaks to man, directs him, tells him how to live his life. You don't see him doing that with any of the rest of his creation. 
And so that gives us great hope, great encouragement that we don't have to look far for what our purpose is in God's creation. We read it there just a moment ago, didn't we? That man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. How do we do that? How do we apply that to everyday life? Well, I think quite simply we can say that we were created for service. We were created to serve God. We were created to serve one another. And so that's what we do. That's our purpose in life is to be serving God and to be serving one another. How do we do that? And and yes, we are getting into to hopefully more uh, uh, details here as it relates to the sanctity of human life. My second encouragement to you is to be amazed by human beings themselves. Let me explain to you uh, uh, what I mean by that. That uh, because of our design, because of the skill and the intricacy that God takes to create human beings, we are capable of things that nothing else in creation is. Uh, to, To state it very, very plainly, as the YouTube channel states that people are awesome. Have you seen these videos? Some of the athletic feats that they are capable of, the skill, the precision that goes into it. uh, uh, I would encourage you to pull up some of these uh, videos. Not now, uh, but after the service uh, uh, to to look at at this. I mean, uh, it's it's awe-inspiring, some of it. That human beings are capable of unbelievable feats of athleticism of engineering. I mean, look at a structure like the Golden Gate Bridge, for instance, or walk around uh, the, the skyscrapers of uh, Chicago. We just recently, this uh, last fall, took a, a boat tour, a, a riverboat tour of the architecture of Chicago. Sounds uh, maybe a little boring, but I mean, it was incredible. Some of the designs, some of the feats that were, were, were accomplished in that. Uh, uh, absolutely unbelievable. Um, I mean, look at even just in our own day and age, in, in the last year, using technology, developing um, a, a, a vaccine for the most deadly virus that the world has, has known in recent memory. All of these speak to our design. And I think that, that, that we are supposed to be amazed by that. Not in a self-centered, navel-gazing sense, but, but giving the credit where credit's due. That this is how God has designed us. This is what he has made us for. How do we use that? How do we go about uh, uh, conveying that? Well, for one thing, we uh, use our abilities for that which is good, to promote goodness in this world, to, uh, as uh, Scripture says elsewhere, to take every opportunity to do good in this world. And I would encourage you, you don't have to look far in your everyday lives to find opportunities to do that which is good, to lend a helping hand, to uh, call and give encouragement maybe to somebody else who is feeling down and out, or what have you. That's what we mean by serving one another. We serve and we seek to do good. And we see this, uh, uh, again, by our design. We are bearing marks of the Creator. And and yes, this is something that the rest of creation does not do. I remember reading a a number of years ago uh, uh, this letter that was written by Charles Darwin to one of his associates, uh, William Graham. 
dated July 3rd, 1881. Charles Darwin writes, But then with me the horrible doubt always arises whether the convictions of man's mind, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. Would anyone trust the convictions of a monkey's mind if there are any convictions in such a mind? This is called Darwin's horrid doubt. From what I understand of his life, it plagued him the entirety of his life, and, and you hear it very plainly there. That we need moral standards if our society is to not only survive, but to increase. Right? We all want to see good increase and evil decrease. How can we do that without absolute moral standards in place? And this is exactly what Darwin is, is confessing here. How, I mean, I mean, go to the zoo. Or after you look at People Are Awesome videos, go uh, look at videos of monkeys and, and chimpanzees, how they interact. And ask yourself, what kind of moral standards does a monkey have? And if mankind is to have evolved from that, then why should we trust a monkey's moral standards? I don't. I don't think you can. I mean, account. I hope that you see the purpose that God is giving to you from this. That we were created to serve. That is, we were created to do good. And this is tethered directly to Genesis 1. By our very design, this is who we are. Why is that? It's because we are created in God's image. And no other part of God's creation bears that image. And so, brothers and sisters, we are to cherish that image. In the way, first of all, we care for our, our own selves. In what you put in your body in the way you drive your car down the road. I mean, all of this is, is, is reflected in this. That we are to be constant agents of good in this dark world all around us. And I think one of the ways that we uh, can, can fight back against some of the challenges to uh, human beings being awesome because they're made in the image of God uh, is to talk to our children about this and to amaze them as well. I was watching, uh, wasn't really watching, but it was on in the background yesterday, one of the, the playoff games in the evening. <laughs> And uh, uh, happened to look up at one point, and uh, big number 73 on the, the Buffalo Bills, Deion Dawkins, uh, was blocking an oncoming uh, defensive end and absolutely manhandling this enormous guy. Deion Dawkins, 6'5", 330 pounds, and moves with cat-like reflexes. And uh, one of my, my sons, uh, uh, one of them was very generous uh, yesterday, gave uh, his mom strep throat for her birthday. That's why they're not here uh, today. Uh, people are still awesome. Kids are still awesome as well, but uh, they do uh, sometimes do that. Uh, but at one point, uh, I pointed out to, to one of my sons, I said, there's Dion Dawkins. I said, do you remember those 40-pound bags of rock salt that Dad carries in uh, to put in the water softener? Uh, he weighs as much, I have to look down at my notes because I'm not a good math guy, as eight bags of rock salt. Can you imagine eight bags of rock salt manipulating with the skill and the precision uh, uh, as that? Uh, this guy, and I'm not a Bills fan, actually. I, I could care less about the Bills, but or Deion Dawkins for that matter, but, but pointing out to my son that, that, that that's a human being uh, that is fearfully and wonderfully made, that, that is capable of tremendous athletic uh, uh, fortitude uh, to amaze them 
as well, to get them excited uh, about them, about human beings themselves. Second thing to talk to them about is, is quite simply, what is the good life? We ended Sunday school this morning asking this question. I would ask that to all of you. When you think of life and the good life, what does that mean? Does it mean, you know, making as much money as you possibly can? Having heated floors in your bathroom or all the luxuries and, and intricacies of, of, of what money can provide? Does it mean, you know, taking lavish vacations several times a year, getting your kids into the, the, the top schools, uh, providing for them so that they can also go on and live this good life? Or does it mean something else? And, and I want to challenge your perceptions if you think that this is all the good life is, is to just simply work hard, earn a bunch of money, not that there's anything wrong with having money. But this is not what Scripture teaches us the good life is. I think we've seen that already. The, the, the good life is to be in service and of service to the people of this world, God's people in God's church, and, and, and as it extends outwardly. The good life is serving those that are in need, serving those moms whose lives have been turned upside down because they made maybe a bad decision, found themselves pregnant, and, and don't know what to do about it. That's the good life, is, is seeking to serve them, laying down a portion of your life for them, seeking to help them and provide for them and to give them sound counsel, to maybe steer them away from making a decision that they maybe will greatly regret, have to live with the rest of their lives. This is what the good life is, the Bible tells us, is service in the kingdom of God. One last thing to talk to your kids about, talk to them about uh, uh, the amazing, amaze them about human beings. Talk to them about the good life, and then thirdly on your own, and already sort of touched on this, but model for them virtuous behavior, good behavior. Live this out before not just your own family, but the children of this church, the, the, the children of your community. Let them see what that looks like. Let them see how uh, uh, someone enthralled with the good life and seeking to serve others uses social media. Use it uh, to model to them uh, uh, how we should think about uh, things like euthanasia and abortion on demand. Teach them the importance of uh, uh, the image of God in which we are created in. And show them discretion in your own behavior on how you deal with that. I was struck uh, last year by, I guess it was maybe two years ago, uh, an article uh, that was in uh, cbsnews.com. Uh, it was entitled, What Kind of Society Do You Want to Live In? As though it was a choice. And it went on, it was an article about uh, the country of Iceland, one that, that I have been to. Uh, and in Iceland, uh, the number, they, they, they say now uh, that there's only one or two babies born with Down syndrome in Iceland each and every year. And some have hailed this as a tremendous uh, uh, accomplishment uh, that, that they have all but or will have in a number of years eradicated Down syndrome uh, from the country of Iceland. 
And then furthermore, holding that up as, as a virtuous thing uh, that can be accomplished worldwide. Uh, uh, in the article, they, they quote, uh, let me read for you this, this quote, geneticist Carrie Stevenson is the founder of Decode Genetics, a company that has studied nearly the entire Icelandic population's genomes. Um, they have a unique perspective on the advancement of medical technology. My understanding, writes Dr. Stevenson, my understanding is that we have basically eradicated almost Down syndrome from our society that there is hardly ever a child with Down syndrome uh, in Iceland anymore. The interviewer asked Stevenson, what does the 100% termination rate you think reflect about Icelandic society? It reflects a relatively heavy-handed genetic counseling, he said. And I don't think that heavy-handed genetic counseling is desirable. You're having impact on decisions that are not medical. I thought that was a fascinating admittance there. A medical doctor admitting that you're having a huge... Because you see, you know, let me just, just pause for, for personal reflection here. Have any of you known anybody with Down syndrome before? If you've ever known somebody, and I, and I mean known them, maybe you don't need to know them all that well. You realize that they are, without a doubt, the happiest people you will ever meet. They are the most honest individuals that you will ever come across. And I need honest people in my life. I remember uh, a young man, Daniel, uh, at uh, one of the churches where we previously served. Uh, and Daniel uh, was in his 20s and had Down syndrome. And what was so special about, there were so many special things I could share with you about Daniel, but I remember every Sunday morning, he would get there early with his mom. And he would sit on this bench in the foyer of the church. Um, and <laughs> it was his duty, it was his job to greet me uh, I don't know why me either, uh, with a hug. Uh, and he would always whisper to me, uh, Pastor Andrew, I love you. Um, the happiness that, that he exhibited. We need more Daniels in our society. We need more uh, uh, honest and loving people like this. And I really, I mean, I, I, I understand, but I really don't understand why we have declared war on the people with Down syndrome in places like Iceland and, and elsewhere around the world. Yes, I, I get it. It's a sacrifice. It's service to, to care for a child with special needs. I and mean, that's part of the reason why uh, in our own personal ministry we have tried to focus an awful lot on special needs ministries. And, and we'll be sharing with you here, hopefully in a couple of weeks, some opportunities this summer that, that the church will have to go and to serve in, in, in like manner. But this is the type of thing that we need to talk to our children about. To make them understand that, that even those that the world deems undesirable, those who are physically handicapped, those who uh, have genetic mutations, those uh, uh, who require an awful lot of care from somebody else, that they too are created in God's image. And because of that, they're, they're worthy. And it's worthwhile to serve them and to see that they are served. This is, this is our goal. This is our purpose as human beings. And it's certainly our purpose as members of the church. So we model that to our children. One man, Rodrigo uh, 
Navarrete uh, wrote, don't look for a church where you'll have an opportunity to use your talents. Look for a church where, where you'll have an opportunity to serve others. Think about that. If our church had the attitude that, that we're coming to serve, what needs do you have? How can I serve you today? If that was the attitude, if that was what was reflected uh, deep down in all of our hearts, how different this church would be, how different this would be. And it's not to say that you're not, some of you aren't doing that. But we need to think like that more and more often to model that type of behavior for our children, for others, for the rest of the world. My fourth encouragement to you this morning is to pray without ceasing. John Piper writes, prayer is not for gratifying natural desires. Prayer is for fruit bearing. What he means by that, I think, is quite simply this. That, that prayer does change outside world, outside circumstances. It, it, it does. And that's, what, that's one reason why we pray. But, but when we pray, there's something else that takes place. There's a transformation sometimes of our desires, of what the outcomes will be in life. But what always happens when we pray is that there is transformation that takes place in our own hearts. Prayer changes us. It changes us by humbling us, by causing us to rely on something other than our own abilities, which, which are awesome, by the way, but insufficient, uh, uh, incomplete, not enough. Prayer teaches us that, that we need to have compassionate hearts, searching out, looking for areas, places where we can serve. And prayer causes us, as it changes our hearts, as it soften our heart, softens our hearts, it causes us to be more and more merciful to those who really need mercy. And as I look out at the world in which we live today, this is a world that needs mercy to be shown. Prayer makes you into that person that the world needs. People in general, I've found, treat others the same or worse than they themselves have been treated. Almost never do we treat people better than we have been treated ourselves. I think this is a big reason why we have seen such a decline in society, such a decline in our uh, world, uh, even in the last uh, year or two. But I want to encourage you that by God's grace, you are able to be an agent of change in that. That as you look to a God who created you, to a God who has been so incredibly merciful to you that you would start to see that reflected back in your own life. Look to the cross again. Jesus willingly came to this world. I mentioned that already. But in his work of salvation for you, he did not treat you as your sins deserved. He laid down his life so that you might have life in him. That's the type of person that, 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 that we become. And prayer helps and aids us in that slow and steady growth. Never cease in praying. You're being transformed. You're being made into what you were created to be. Someone who serves, someone who loves deeply, and someone who understands mercy because they've seen it in their Lord and Savior and are able then to extend it into a world of need. And then my final encouragement to you, and I will be brief here because I really don't want to bring politics into the pulpit with me. 
but quite simply to encourage you to vote with your conscience. There's nothing wrong with voting your conscience and understanding that uh, the way we treat one another, the way we treat uh, all life, especially unborn life, is a matter of the conscience, but it also should impact how we choose our leaders. So be well researched. Go and, and find out what your elected officials Positions are on uh, all of these issues that pertain to human life. And maybe use that as a guide uh, when you go to the polls next. So in conclusion, brothers and sisters, never, never, never lose hope in taking a stand for human life that we were created in a glorious and amazing, awesome image. And that this is reflected in each one of us. And so each one of us has a role to play in this plan that God has for this, his world. Look to Jesus. Be encouraged. Become merciful as he was and go and serve in his kingdom. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we ask now that you would guide and direct our steps. Help us to uh, speak when necessary. Help us to hold back uh, our words when necessary. Help us know uh, the difference, that we would be wise in all of this. We pray for those uh, who are not being uh, treated today as their image uh, deserves to be. We pray for those uh, young mothers facing difficult decisions. And we pray for those uh, uh, who have been affected by uh, abortion. Lord, that you would lead them to yourself and allow them to see the great mercy that you have. We pray this all in Jesus' name.
Receive now the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord has make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.